So I'm, I'm going to, when I first met with Mike about giving a talk, he said, tell everybody what you're doing in Tanzania. Uh, and I said, okay. So he goes, tell me what you're doing in Tanzania. <laughs> so I even said, more okay. And so that's what this talk is about. I just want to give you a little bit of overview what we've been doing. I came back to Duke in, in the beginning of 2012. Really because of the promise Haywood Brown, our chair, made to me to be able to do some global health, which I really had gotten interested in. So everybody has to have learning objectives, but the bottom line learning objectives is I'm going to try to take you all to Tanzania and kind of give you a feel of what's there, what we're doing there, and then finish up with our research at the end. And so this is going to represent uh, the last three years of, of going to KCMC in Tanzania. And just to give some of y'all, and I know this is like global health and y'all know about the globe and all that stuff, but yeah, Moshi's a long way away and that little line is not really how you go there. It's like a long, <laughs> circuitous route to get there. It's about 20 plus hours of flying. So it, it dawns on you that you're really a long way up from home in a, in a lot of different ways. So an important part of it is, is getting to feel comfortable and meeting people, etc. This is a little bit of the history of Tanzania, which I didn't know until I started going. I just heard it was a pretty place that a lot of people go to on safari, which is all very true. But it's just recently become a republic and it, it, it's a relatively new independent country, which is a very stable and at least by perception a very safe place to be in places in the world that aren't so safe. There's an election this year, so there's a little bit of, you know, partying in the streets and all that, but nothing like some of the riots that have taken place in other parts of the world around election time. So. We really, really have enjoyed being there. KCMC sits at the foot of Mount Kilimanjaro. And literally, when the sky is clear every day you walk to work, you just look up and see Mount Kilimanjaro, which is, it never really gets old. But it doesn't really tell the story about the people that are there. And I want to give you a little idea of, of where and, and who and all of that, that we, what makes up our experience there. So Moshi is, this is the town of Moshi. Uh, it's not that big. Uh, it's got the highest literacy rate in Tanzania. It has a universal primary school for everybody. Uh, there are a lot of secondary schools. It doesn't cost much to go to high school, but uh, you have to maintain grades, etc. There are two universities there, and Tumani is the university that has the medical school, which we're associated with. These are just some street sites from Moshi. Oh, those little things are dala dollas, which if you haven't ever ridden one, it's kind of a real experience. They pack about 30 people in those things with chickens and goats and smells. <laughs> have you ridden one? I, I, have, I almost got on one of that chicken. I chickened out. <laughs> but anyway, it, it, and I know Nimi hasn't ridden one. I, <laughs> my wife hasn't ridden one either. Um, but they're fun. So this is just pictures of us hanging out. Y'all recognize John Bartlett. We're eating at his favorite little barbecue place, which is really, really good, but you don't really want to see how they make it necessarily, but which he did take us on a tour of the kitchen, which was kind of wonderful. So these are just pictures of me and the faculty and some of the as a resident, his sister and wife, and that's my partner, Peyton Taylor, who's a GYN oncologist at the University of Virginia. Uh, it's taken in John's, uh, John Bartlett's living room, and that's me meeting a kid that is really sweet. Uh, these are just pictures. That's uh, the, the guy here is Abato, who is our uh, administrative person on the ground in Tanzania, and uh, has helped with us and many of the studies that, that have gone on. And, uh, and we've worked with him for a long time since I've been going to Tanzania. Uh, that's the mountain, that's sunset. Those are nursing students who are just so adorable. They all live in a dorm on camp on the KCMC campus and they're just wonderful and colorful and interested in learning. That's a picture I bought from my office, more street <laughs> stuff. 
these people, I, I really, these are special people. He makes banana drawings of which I've drawn a whole, I mean, bought a whole bunch of for Christmas present. This is Mr. Masangi, our, one of our cab drivers and his lovely wife. And that's John, one of our cab drivers. This is just some of the people that we've met. So KCMC is the largest hospital in <clears throat> the largest hospital in Moshi and for, one of the largest in all of Tanzania. You have to go to Dar es Salaam to get larger. Uh, it was founded by a religious foundation, albeit it takes care of everyone. It was the Good Samaritan founded it in 1971. It has a research institute um, and they have been uh, really, really successful in part because of the collaboration with the Duke Global Health Institute, particularly in AIDS and HIV research on the ground, um, of which John Bartlett's been a big part of. So this is the current leadership that we're dealing with. Uh, this is Jilliard Masanga, who was the department chair of OBGYN, who is now the executive director, has recently been made the executive director of KCMC which really means you've got a very big advocate for women's health now running the hospital. So whereas before women's health was kind of a, an afterthought, now it is really being pushed to the forefront. All of a sudden I've noticed new paint, the floor is cleaner, and, and he is very, very committed to making this the women's health services there are a really optimal place, and, and it's just amazing that, that he is now the executive director. Hey, Jana. Um, anyway, so these are these are other people we work with. This is Dr. Aneka, who was the previous chair before Masanga. This is Dr. Pinda, who is now the chair. All these people have visited Duke in the Global Health Institute as well as OBGYN. I, I think. Blandina has been here, and I'm not sure if Sarah has been here or not, but most of them have had some connection with Duke. <laughs> so this is kind of what we're doing at KCMC right now. We have provide on-site coverage about 19 to 20 weeks out of the year. We give lectures on just virtually everything. Uh, we do the oral examinations. Uh, for the student, the medical students and residents, and their oral exams are really impressive. They're at the beds, 180 students at the bedside, having evaluated a patient for an hour, and then they have 20 minutes to present the patient to us with a differential diagnosis, a plan for the most, what they think the diagnosis is. These patients are just wonderful because most of them are very, very sick and they go through all this time after time, like two, two times a day for a whole week. And by the end, they're, kind of, they're, changed, they're just changing their stories around. They're just playing with these students. So it's really kind of fun to, to watch and they wink at you while they're going. It's, it's really great. We're trying to get a video conferencing between our residents and the KCMC residents and faculty. This would be for clinical cases. We provided up to date, which is looks like the universal medical student resident reference thing, which I don't necessarily like, but everybody always tells me what up to date it said. So <laughs> it must be good. Um, but I wish they would read the literature a little bit more. But anyway, both here and there. Uh, we participate in direct patient care. We go, go to the OR with their residents and students. We work in clinics. We do rounds. Uh, we're teaching them minimally invasive surgery within the confines of their resources and safety. We have simulators. We provide them online courses and we're doing case, simple laparoscopic cases with them. Uh, we're act as consultants for their research projects uh, and mentoring, et cetera. So that's sort of what we're doing. And then just some of the clinical pictures from KCMC, since part of this is clinical care. Um, I wanted to look at that, but there's like monitors everywhere. Yeah. So I guess I don't really need to post. Huh? <laughs> yeah, they're everywhere. Uh, so this is always one of the first things that struck me at being at KCMC was there were coffin makers all around the hospital, which was kind of shocking. Like there must be 25 coffin makers and they make really nice coffins. I mean, I actually 
walked up and browsed and looked at it. You could select the color and the padding and all. It was really nice, but it, it, the, it was juxtaposed to a lot of babies being born there. So it's, you know, really, it dawns on you, golly, the people are dying here a lot. They're sometimes dying very young, and it's very, very poignant as to how young they are, especially in maternal, maternal health. Um, this is some pictures from labor in, labor in delivery at KCMC. This is the actual delivery room, which there are four little cubicles where you're taken in advanced labor and are delivered usually by nurse midwives there. Occasionally I sneak down there with medical students and we do deliveries and really have a lot of fun. This is my daughter Maria who actually introduced me and Dora, one of the nurses there. Uh, who introduced me to Global Health when she went to nursing school and then told me I had to go back. And I, I went back with her for a month and just got kind of addicted to it. And that was in 2009. Um, so that was my excuse for getting into Global Health. Anyway, this is my partner Peyton Taylor doing a cancer operation at KCMC on a woman with a very advanced ovarian cancer. Now, he has mixed feelings about doing this because ovarian cancer is treated first by surgery to debulk the disease, but it has to be followed up by chemotherapy or you're just putting somebody through a horrible operation with no real chance of survival. So the access to chemotherapy is, is not great. So he, he will do these operations, but there needs to be arrangements made for, for subsequent chemotherapy, et cetera. And rumor has it, and I think it's gonna be a reality, there is gonna be a cancer center at KCMC and there will be availability of chemotherapy and radiation therapy, et cetera. The only one in Tanzania right now is in Dar es Salaam called Ocean Road, and it's very difficult to get patients there that have GYN or any kind of cancer, actually. <laughs> Uh, this is probably one of the, the biggest problems in Sub-Saharan Africa, and Melissa can talk about this a lot better than I can, but this is a vesicovaginal fistula, and, and this is probably one of the most miserable conditions uh, of humanity, and this is a, usually a result of a neglected childbirth, typically a very young woman who labors in her village at home, for days and days and days until the baby finally dies and gets so soft and squishy it just comes out. But before that, a fetal head has been pushing on a bladder for so long that the, the bladder base dies basically, it just necrosis and dies. And they're left with a huge hole between the vagina and, and bladder, which causes them to just leak urine constantly. So, you, you know, they have virtually horrible hygiene, they become excoriated, terrible, it would be a malignant diaper rash, basically. And uh, not only that, the social aspects of this would be they're ostracized from their families, their villages, they're often put in little shacks or lean-tos behind their houses, their husbands leave them, they're left usually with a dead baby that is infertile because they've had to have a hysterectomy as a result of their neglected labor and infection and all that. But anyway, suffice it to say, they do amazing things with fistula surgery. And, and Dr. Masango, who's now the executive director, is a master fistula surgeon, and watching him do these is, is truly an art. It looks like really easy that you just go, oh, we'll put it, we'll just sew that up and it'll, it'll be great, but it's not really easy. And when he does them, this is, it's hard to see because so many people want to learn and see how to, how to do this. So if you've ever tried to see one, it's, it's tough. I'm old, so I can usually push in there and be right up close. Um, anyway, his success rate is very, very good. And one of the things when he became executive director, I told him, I said, you cannot give up doing these surgeries. And so he's got a dedicated day still that he's doing that. He's training protégés to, to do this. This was a patient that was one of the most interesting patients I've seen, and it's a young girl with, uh, we suspect, she was HIV positive, and we suspect had lymphoma, but we have no way to diagnose it. But for those of you that are, are medically inclined, this is a, a patient that's 32 weeks 
pregnant uh, and has massive lymphadenopathy in her right side of her neck extending down into her chest which has blocked her superior vena cava which drains the blood out of your head and face and so they treat it with massive uh, upper body edema, they get collateral blood vessels that circumvent the vena cava to return blood to the inferior vena cava and get it back to the heart. Um, usually this can be easily treated depending on the cause and the two most common causes are now in the U.S. lung cancer but in the developing world either TB or, or lymphoma. This we guess this to be lymphoma because she had no other symptoms of TB and she was HIV positive. But before we could treat her with chemo and emergency radiation because there were, we didn't have that available, she died and she was an 18 year old, first birth, yeah, 18 year old, first pregnancy, delightful kid. And it, I mean, it was, it's just, it was tragic because this is a easily treatable disease if you have resources to do it. Uh, this was another interesting <coughs> postpartum patient we had with a bowel obstruction that was HIV positive and we finally, uh, she had a vaginal delivery, very uncomplicated and just her belly blew up and started throwing up and awful and after watching her for several days and not getting relief, <coughs> we finally explored her and she, her, her small bowel was completely full of tumor, and this was a Kaposi's sarcoma, which you usually don't see in the intestines, you see it on the skin and other places, but um, which is a result of AIDS, HIV AIDS. Uh, again, a very young woman, probably in her early 20s, with a very unusual, strange presentation. Uh, this is an all too common problem of, uh, of an illegal abortion gone bad which is a major problem in Sub-Saharan Africa, and Tanzania abortions are illegal. And so they seek them out uh, where they can get them. And often, as in this case, the uterus is perforated, the baby is extruded into the abdomen, they become infected, septic, end up with a hysterectomy, and often die as a result of this. So it, it, it's a real issue there. And I would say probably every time I have ever made rounds, there's always been two or three young girls that have had the sequelae of illegal abortion. Um, this is just me pontificating on rounds, which I did a lot. Um, rounds take forever. This is one of the lounges, rounds. This is our cervical cancer screening clinic. This is how records are kept. There's no EPIC or EMR yet. They're talking about getting an EMR in Tanzania. I just want to see how that will go over. But, but right now it's all done in ledgers and, and they keep uh, dates, numbers, a sketch, and they also record pictures on this monitor, which we'll get into in a little bit when I talk about our research. There, how am I doing on time? Okay. Um, these are just more pictures from being there. These are some of the residents. These are, uh, this woman's getting a spinal. This is our ultrasound unit. This is a resident who just graduated, Emmanuel, who just moved back to Rwanda. Uh, this is teaching an emergency obstetrical course and with a simulator and doing a vacuum extraction. Uh, this is just a visiting European resident or student, I can't remember. Uh, these are some of the babies we've delivered. This is a, actually the first baby I ever delivered in Tanzania, and I went back and made her take a picture with me. She could tell how excited she was to do it. <laughs> I actually kind of begged her. I, it was, I was one of the pictures. See, for those of y'all from clinic, I do still deliver babies, but I just don't do it at Duke anymore. But, um, <laughs> I can't quite give it up. Uh, this is the, the residents have the option, and it's, it's sort of a pressured option to do a master's, get a master's degree, and, the, and this is, they have to defend their thesis. They do a one-year research project and then present it, um, and, and it's judged by internal and external examiners, which are very, very tough on these kids. They are it's amazing the quality of their research as well as, as how they're judged on it. 
This is our typical after exam uh, kind of cocktail that also mi it would mix with tonic in a little lime is a good malaria preventative because of the quinine and we like that. This is teaching the residents laparoscopic skills with a simulator that we, we bought. I actually just got another one, so we'll have two, that they can practice doing all kinds of things to get dexterity. Uh, and they do have a lot of laparoscopic equipment. I'm just not quite convinced that the safety's quite there yet. And so we're still kind of working on that before they start trying to do advanced laparoscopic stuff. This is a, a new hysteroscopic unit as well as an endometrial ablation unit that we got as a grant from Hologic that will allow us to look inside the uterus in women with bleeding issues and then do an ablation of the endometrium in women that don't want childbearing any longer. And you can treat them for bleeding with a 10 minute procedure without a hysterectomy, etc. cetera, um, which has gone over really well so far. These are rounds. This is a, they are typical teaching rounds and lecturing. This is one of our residents, Sarah Dotson, who, I don't know if she's here, she didn't come, I guess. She was gonna come, but, um, who was just recently there lecturing to some of the students. Um, we taught the residents how to do LEAP procedures, and for those of y'all that don't, don't know what a LEAP procedure is, it, it stands for, um, loop electrical excisional procedure. So really you shouldn't really put procedure there because that's redundant. It's like procedure, procedure. But um, what you do is just take a, a cautery, a wire with cautery and core out abnormal cells on the uterine cervix. And this is the same simulation I do here for our residents. And uh, we use a water bottle vagina and a chicken and, uh, and then do these leap and cord out things. And, as often happens in the middle of a great simulation like this, the power goes off. And so after doing s several nice leaps, then I'm just left, so there's no little light up on the little generator, and so I'm left with just having to wing it and cough, but, which didn't go over all that well. Um, this is, uh, I had to put Melissa on here, and this was when they were in Durham. We were in Durham, and there too, uh, colleagues from KCMC, including Masanga's wife, Mary, uh, right there were in, uh, where were we, at Nosh? Yeah, and uh, having dinner, which they loved the fried chicken at Nosh. <laughs> but this is us doing urodynamic testing on somebody with stress and incontinence. Now, in the, in the United States, you have very fancy transducers, and you can measure bladder pressures and incontinence and all that. Here, you put a syringe with a tube going into a bladder and you fill it with water and you watch it go up and down, which indicates bladder contract, uninhibited bladder contractions, which then lead to something, all those commercials on Detron and stuff when you can't make it to the bathroom. That, that's what we're looking for and that, whether to treat this medically or surgically. And, and that's a very crude, but very accurate way to, to measure things. This was the first fetal monitor device we got in Tanzania that actually recorded. This wasn't a strip, so Jan, if you're worried, where we are, no, it, no, it's not a baby about to die. I just put that up there for dramatic effect. But this is, you would not really want to see this for those of y'all who have an obstetrical background. Um, but anyway, we, I've subsequently blown this fetal monitor up. Uh, probably because it just had a power surge and so I'm trying to get a fuse and something else to fix it and that's one of the challenges of global health that I've come up with is power is a real issue. I had to give this for John Barley even though he's in, in Tanzania right now having a great time except there's no power at their house for the most, most of the time they've been there. And uh, Catherine Lynch Staten, who's pregnant and staying at our house right now, has no power, so no refrigerator, no nothing. So I'm wondering how that, or hot water. Uh, so I'm wondering how that's all going. But John has done so much amazing stuff. I really consider him my mentor in global health. And I, I, I just wanted to put this in to, to thank him. But he has done so much for education. At KCMC, they've now dedicated a whole floor of the medical school to him and they had a big ceremony and there's a plaque there and he is just a real treasure and, 
and uh, I think Duke and the Global Health Institute are really, really lucky to have him. That's his lovely wife, Trish, who is, is not always right, but never in doubt. And I, I get a lot. You know, <laughs> I mean, a, she is amazing. I love her. Sitting and having gin and tonic with them, which we were doing right there, we learned so much about global health. It's uh, amazing. Uh, this is uh, some of the, one of the residents that has come here. This is Nicholas. A lot of y'all met Nicholas. This is his little boy, Victor, and his wife, who's a dermatologist in Moshi. This is Victor now, let, letting me take pictures of him. This is Pinda, the now chair of OBGYN, and me with the, at a Carolina Hurricanes game. He was so amazed at ice hockey of which he had never seen. It, it, we just had such a great time. It was, it was hilarious. It's kind of like soccer, only really they were slipping around. They were being really rough. <laughs> so, anyway, uh, this is one of the residents that has visited. We, uh, I'm originally from Texas, and I have uh, connections with the University of Texas still. And when they called and wanted to send one of their residents, Melinda McNeil, uh, to KCMC, we worked it out where she could come through Duke and then go to KCMC and just had a marvelous experience. She now has graduated and is actually uh, in Austin, Texas, uh, a part of her job on the faculty of the medical, the new Austin Medical School, University of Texas at Austin Medical School. It's called the Dell Medical School because I suspect the Dell Computer Company has funded the whole thing. But, um, She's running a clinic for victims of sexual trafficking or human trafficking, and uh, it's just, it has published a paper in the Green Journal on or the Obstetrics and Gynecology Journal on it, and the the health needs and the psychological needs of that population, of which in any border state is extremely high. Even in North Carolina, it is actually extremely high. Uh, th this is uh, Lucy and. Her little boy, oh, what's his name? Jonathan. Jonathan, Jonathan Wisdom, yeah. And uh, just this kid is the wildest kid ever, but just so much fun to be around. Um, this is Diana, who's also one of our residents that went last year and really, really worked hard, she told me. And then when I got there, she, uh, this is what I found. She's just kind of <laughs> hanging out and, you know, and just, but, but so they work and play, but they do do a lot of work. This is her doing a, a C, getting ready to do a C-section, and this is what usually comes out of a C-section. Very expensive tumors that last for a really long time. <laughs> uh, keep you awake at night. <laughs> but they are kind of cute. <laughs> and, anyway, um, I can say that we have three. Um, this is Sarah Dotson, who is one of our most recent people that have gone, and uh, this is Sarah giving her lecture, and this was a sort of minimally invasive surgical technique doing a, a ectopic through a mini lap instead of a laparoscopy. But they normally, if they have an ectopic or tubal pre pregnancy in the tube that ruptures, they make a giant incision from their belly button down to their pubis. and rip them open and remove this tube and she did it through a little inch and a half two inch incision just above the pubic bone and they were just sitting there aghast that she could actually do it these are uterine fibroids that actually grow pretty big in sub-saharan africa not because they're any different than they are in durham they actually grow this big in durham too but but I think there's a lot of neglecting them there and they let them get this big, which makes surgery a little bit more difficult as well as the need for transfusion because of the difficulty, technical difficulties. And blood is a very precious commodity in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, this is uh, our Global Health Fellow who's here who didn't provide me with any clinical pictures except here she's working on her research project. She's doing data analysis. She says, but I think she's watching YouTube videos. You know? <laughs> but what, what we did, and here she is fixing the leak machine that was broken. This is Marley and Jana, you can't see, but they technically really screwed this machine up. I don't know what, <laughs> what, but it never worked. It was the smoke evacuator. We couldn't make it work. And we had leaps to do and everything, but it's sad. 
So Nancy, you know, so Tish, things break. <laughs> <It's>, uh, <laughs> but we had no repair guy to call. So I put Jana on it and Marley on it. But we did recruit her to paint the cabinets in our kitchen, which I think she's done a marvelous job. She, we finally, after 12 straight hours of painting, let her get up. <laughs> we did. She really, it was, it was nice. We did paint the cabinets, so though. I thought I'd keep that kind of in mind. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the current research that's going on. And, uh, and, and I'm glad Nimi's here because she can really correct any of my inaccuracies. But a lot of, uh, which I probably have a lot of, uh, a lot of what we're doing is really trying to fight cervical cancer. So in order to kind of understand that, I want to talk a little bit first about the research projects that were done by the residents this year, one of which was on cervical cancer this one here, and these were the others, it, it, to let you know the quality of the research that they're doing, because these were one, timely, good topics, and two, they were done to a degree that they are publishable, with a little bit of cleaning up and, and help. I think these will all get published in some international journal, and they're pertinent both to KCMC as well as Tanzania and maybe East Africa in general. But uh, the first one, looking at HPV infection and lesions and HIV positive women, uh, adolescents and young women, is a very timely thing because prior to availability of antiretroviral therapy, we have a whole generation of young women that have gotten congenital HIV that was passed to them in birth. Uh, and so those women are different in terms of their susceptibility to HP, HPV infection and subsequent cervical lesions. And so they need to be followed a little bit differently, but nobody's really quantitated what those lesions are and how aggressive they are, et cetera. So a very important study. This is a major problem. Perinatal asphyxia either kills babies or it leaves them very, very damaged. And I tell you, a kid with Cerebral palsy in Tanzania is not going to survive. They just have no resources that they do here. Um, and then group B strep colonization. Group B strep in the U.S. we knew is a major cause of neonatal sepsis. That in E. coli. In, in the U.S., anybody, all pregnant women are cultured for group B strep at 36 weeks. And if they're positive, they're given antibiotics in labor to help prevent in fact, neonatal sepsis, which has been incredibly successful. And here, no one knows what the colonization rate is. They don't know if it's cost effective to do that. They do know babies die of neonatal sepsis in Tanzania. So just to quantitate that, I think is important, and then come up with an intervention that may, whether it's the American intervention or something else, that can help. But now we're going to talk about cervical cancer, which has really kind of gotten me into working with NIMI and doing this, and I have really come to feel very passionate about it. And, and I'm sure you all have all heard of this book, and I tell you, if you haven't read it, it's incredible, not only because of the implications on medical research and use of tissue and lack of IRBs and this, that, and the other, but... Um, it is a story of a young, incredibly young woman who died of cervical cancer. And it was a parent and a daughter and a sister, etc. So if you haven't read it, it is a great read and I have no financial interest. I don't even know who Rebecca is, but, but <laughs> I just know she's a good writer and I would recommend it. Um, this is Howard Jones, who just recently died at the age of 104. Uh, Howard Jones was the physician, the OBGYN, then at Johns Hopkins, that biopsied her, sent that tissue to a man named George Gay in a lab at, at Hopkins, and grew her cells from this cancer. The first successful clone cell culture line that has remained for, generate, for thousands of generations now. They're sold all over the world. Uh, her family basically got nothing for this, and the commercial enterprises have literally made 
billions of dollars off of her tumor cells. And the story of that, that's why it's the immortal, she still lives on in various freezers and cell culture labs, etc. But Howard Jones, who died this year, like several months ago, uh, does anybody know what else he was famous for? Nobody knows. So he, he, he hit mandatory retirement at Hopkins at, I think, 70, and he went on to Eastern Virginia School of Medicine where him and his wife, Georgiana Jones, <coughs> founded the Jones Institute, where he and his wife were responsible for the first IVF baby in the United States, the second IVF baby in the world. Um, that woman is now 31 years old. Uh, so any IVF pregnancy that has occurred in the U.S., which they occur every single day now, uh, was a result of him and his wife. So I don't think he did, ethically did anything bad to Henrietta Lacks. He was trying to help her, and by culturing his cells, learn, her cells learn more about the biology of her disease and thus how to help her. But enough pontificating. So I was going to put here the brains and the beauty and the inspiration, but then I thought, that's just too sexist. I better not put it to you. But, <laughs> but I, so I'm sorry. Where, where's Nimi? Where'd you go? I'm behind the pillar. I'm sorry. Okay. So, but anyway, so she's sort of the brains for all this. This was the announcement in the September 22nd global health uh, email I got, and I was very impressed that... Uh, it was there and it made me very proud. So uh, thank you for letting me work with you. It's, it's wonderful. So a lot of these slides I stole from her, but this is all over anywhere. You can get this data, but this is cervical cancer mortality worldwide. And, and you know, what I tell our residents is we would, would like to convert in sub-Saharan Africa, some parts of South America, India, um, make, the dark reddish brown into tan or even white. Why is Canada so good? Um, there's just, just as much HPV in Canada. Uh, I'm just gonna put that out there, but anyway. Uh, that's, that's the mortality, and get it into numbers, this is the North Carolina relatively recent data. So if you look at cervical cancer in, in North Carolina, these are projected new cases, and these are the deaths, and this was in 2013. So we're still seeing it here, but I'll show you some rates in a minute. So here are the state rate per 100,000, it's 7.3, this is the US rate. District of Columbia, high HIV area. Wyoming, what goes on? Is it just that boring that they're doing it? I don't know. I don't know. It's a pretty state, but I couldn't quite figure out Wyoming here. But uh, anyway, um, this is probably the only cancer we know of that's a sexually transmitted cancer, so it does relate to that. But if you take that 7.5, uh, prevalence rate and look at sub-Saharan Africa this is kind of the numbers you get and these are places we're going with our study and this is Zambia Tanzania and Kenya is Rwanda and it's about seven eight times the incidence in the US it is the number one cancer killer of women in sub-Saharan Africa and in other parts of the developing world not breast cancer not lung cancer but cervical cancer, uh, a miserable disease. And for those of you that are not clinicians and are not OBGYNs, so this is the vagina, the cervix is the opening of the uterus, and cancer of the cervix involves the cervix, obviously, um, as opposed to cancer of the uterus, which involves the uterus or ovaries that involve the ovaries or tubes, and that's my OBGYN lesson for the day. Um, <laughs> And when you look at the cervix, this is normal, this is low grade precancerous stuff, higher grade, and then this is cancer. Uh, and the good thing and what makes cervical <coughs> cancer potential, potentially preventable is there's a long transition usually here. And it's some, in, in some cases estimated to be about 10 years. So you have a long time before it gets to this unless you're HIV, uncontrolled HIV positive or whatever, and it progresses much quicker. 
Uh, these are actual pictures uh, from the colposcopic views, which are just magnified views of the cervix. This is normal. This is a, a stage one or earlier invasive cancer. And this is the cervix completely replaced by cancer, which it's you know, pretty hard to miss that as a, as a diagnosis. These are the stages which you don't really care about, except to say, I mean, I care about them, but y'all don't care about them. But it, in terms of the death rate, it's very much correlated with the stage of cancer, and that's true for any cancer, not just cervical cancer. But if you intervene in, in early stage cervical cancer, in especially non-invasive cervical cancer, it's basically a curable disease, even in early invasive cancer. And these are not deaths from cervical cancer. This is overall survival rate. So basically nobody with a stage zero, which is carcinoma in situ, ought to die from cervical cancer. So this means that some of these with a 7% died of trauma, homicide, other causes, etc. But once it hits advanced stage disease where it is spread outside of the cervix and vagina, the, the survival rate falls very, very rapidly and it is a miserable way to die. Um, it's an HPV related disease. It, it really is a sexually transmitted cancer. This is HPV. Um, there are a lot of different HPVs and we'll talk about, but the important HPVs are these. These are the HPVs that are subtypes that are associated with cervical cancer. The ones in the most common vaccine used, we'll talk about it in a minute, Gardasil is 16 and 18, but they're all built pretty much the same way. Some of the, the actual components of the oncogenes are different, which is what makes some high risk and some low risk. There's over 120 now different subtypes uh, but these are the ones that will account for about 99% of all the cancers. Uh, Zerhausen is the person that discovered HPV as a usual big discoveries like penicillin or this. It's usually by accident. And he was working to, to prove that H herpes was the cause of cervical cancer, but subsequently found out it was HPV and it, it resulted in him getting the Nobel Prize. Uh, which he shared with the ones that isolated HIV. So uh, again, he isolated 1618, uh, which leads to 70% of all the cervical cancer. So this is what I was talking about, the natural history of cervical cancer. This is normal, it gets infected, and you start to progressively get precancerous changes, and then finally the cancer invades into the deeper tissues. The good news is, just like I said, it's a long time of progression, and so it has to persist, and that's an important thing before you're ever going to get invasive cancer out of this. So most sexually, and these were studies done in college uh, health, health centers, and most sexually active women have HPV, which in turn means most sexually active men have HPV. Um, though men are not screened as women were back then. Um, most infections are asymptomatic and almost all of them go away within two years. So that's a really important key in a healthy, young, healthy woman that is not a smoker, they will go away. So many of them have high risk or oncogenic types, they still go away. And again, cervical cancer only results from persist, persistent infection and with certain subtypes. So that's important to know. It's the same thing in graphical things. So young women, high incidence of, of HPV at sexual debut, and it rapidly clears. A few persist into a precancer, and then you start to see cancer mid-30s or so, usually. Um, this is the HPV bur burden of different cancers, and I, I won't bore you with all this, but this is really uh, looking at the developed versus the undeveloped world, and, and HPV is involved with a lot of cancers. Cervix, penis, vulva, vagina, anus, mouth. Or if we have a friend that's a GYN oncologist in Fort Worth, Texas, who did a lot of uh, uh, laser ablation of uh, HPV-related HPV vulvar disease and got squamous cell carcinoma of the tongue and as probably an occupational hazard of 
inhaling a lot of smoke from viral particles. Uh, but it, it, it's a huge burden of cancer attributed to HPV. So screening for cervical cancer, everybody's heard of pap smears. Well, this is the guy that invented pap smears, George Papanicolaou. And if you invent a pap smear or something that cool, you get your name on money. This was back when Greek money actually meant something. Uh, or a stamp, which is really cool. Uh, but anyway, so this is just some of his history, which I'm going to run out of time. But I, I, I want you to know that... Uh, he did his initial studies on his special case, which usually, which turned out later to be his wife. She was getting paps like every day to look at what the changes were with the menstrual cycle and also he could describe them in his atlas. So what a dedicated, Lisa? Dedicated. <laughs> 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 But he started out even more impressive than that. He did pap smears on guinea pigs. <laughs> now that's that ain't easy. But anyway, eventually that led to the publication of his exfoliative cytology, which just defined for people what normal looked like. He then started to look at smears of carcinoma of the uterus, of which they didn't have, they didn't differentiate cervix from uterus, so most of these were really cervical cancer. Very rare in, before the obesity epidemic to see uterine cancer. So anyway, it eventually led to the American Cancer Society deciding to promote this. It led to small-scale studies that led to large-scale studies of that and the rest is history, but basically this is a pap smear. Everybody kind of, if you haven't seen it from the business end, this is the business end. You, you basically swab the, the cervix, this is the internal part of the cervix, and then a spatula for the extra. And then these incredibly dedicated cyto, cytology techs will prepare the slides, look at them, and then they're reviewed by cytologists. If something comes back abnormal, the gold standard in the U.S. is to do something called colposcopy, where you get a fancy machine that costs about twenty thousand, or like the one I looked at yesterday, which was thirty-four thousand. Um, anyway, uh, and it magnifies the cervix, and you can look for areas like this white area uh, that is abnormal. This is expensive. It's it's labor intensive. It requires cytology or pre-screening, et cetera. So in Africa right, or in Tanzania right now, they're using a 35 millimeter camera and putting acetic acid on the cervix and looking and taking pictures of that white epithelium. And I'm gonna show you some of the differences in what has led to our research. So if you do screening in the US in places that are really are resource deprived, this is expensive and this is all the stuff you need to do that. You need PAP materials, training, personnel, microscopes, reporting system. You gotta have somebody to triage, evaluate the results. You have to have a colposcope, biopsies, training, blah, 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 blah. And then they have to come back and you have to have the facilities to do all this expensive, intense, so the WHO came up with what to do in the developing world specifically in, in Sub-Saharan Africa and came up with this the VIA recommendation which stands for visual inspection with acetic acid, which acetic acid is vinegar. So you put vinegar on the cervix, any abnormal areas will turn white and this is really all you need. You can then take a picture of it with a camera or not even do that if you don't have a camera. If you see something that looks abnormal, you can treat it right there on the spot, either by cauterizing it or freezing it or something if you have it available to you to treat. It has very high sensitivity, meaning it overcalls a lot of stuff because inflammation can cause white epithelium. Plain, something called metaplasia, which just is a normal occurrence, can cause it. And therefore, it has low specificity. So it's you overtreat a lot of women with disease destined to go away, um, but you just don't know. But it does result in unnecessary treatment. This is a clinic for, that where cervical cancer screenings done. 
this is somebody doing VIA and they got a headlamp and, and they're just looking at the cervix. These are some of the pictures of VIA. Um, this is a cryoprobe, which is freezing the, the abnormalities. This is a lesion in the cervix. These are the results. It's positive, you treat it. Negative, they go back to routine screening. Positive, it's too big to treat on site, or they think it's cancer, or it's for sure cancer, and they have to refer, refer those. But a lot of them can just be seen and treated right on site. So this, I stole this from Nimi, I stole a lot of these from Nimi, but this, is, this was also one I did. So this is the typical VIA or HPV screening in India. Uh, colposcopy, cryo, and leave done at a, a district hospital, and then cancer treatment at a referral hospital. These are the barriers that we found to screening in the developing world, lack of training, lack of resources, financial <laughs> education, everything you think of religion and, and the sex of the people screening uh, has all come into play. So then, you know, after talking to Nimi and Aneka there, this is, you know, has evolved into what the what if. So what if you could enhance training, provide an expensive technology that would give you all these great things. You would create a database for training. Uh, it would be less intimidating than pointing a giant 35 millimeter camera at their vulva. And I don't know about you, but a lot of patients don't really get like that. You know, they just don't get, think that's funny. Um, they're even thinking about doing this without a speculum, which would be amazing. Free up expensive resources as most screening could be done in rural settings and less need for long distance transportation for consultation. So this has evolved into a huge team of people, which now there's probably more uh, people involved in this. Um, and the development by NIMI's lab of this, and this is one of the prototypes. It now looks a little different than that. They brought it to Clinic Monday and it was very Carolina blue. Why was it so Carolina blue? Um. It was Duke, the one I last saw in the I video. Know, was, I, know. I was like, no, wait, but it took great pictures, I have to say. But it's, it, you know, it's developed uh, to be about the size of a, of a tampon. Well, Nimi says a tampon. It's probably the most super tampon you've ever seen. But, uh, <laughs> but a tampon nevertheless. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and anyway, and so these are just some pictures that comparing a the colposcope in this. This is a, a, another updated prototype. The one now looks really good. The one they brought to Clinic Monday. Uh, this was in Zambia, Grosbeck Parham, getting images sent to him via phone, or they use a computer <laughs> where he could review any questionable thing. This comes from like 50 sites into him. He's got an amazing place to do this. This was Nimi and I doing the first one of the, using that in, in Zambia. Uh, and I was really proud of that because the pictures were phenomenal and all the providers and more importantly, the nurses that did the screening were so impressed. It just, it was probably one of my best days <laughs> doing this. Anyway, these are some of the pictures we have now taken. This, these were actually taken in Africa and not in our clinic here, though I have pictures from that. Uh, and I won't bore you with some of the details, but this is a white lesion here. This is an IUD, IUD strings coming out of the surgery, so it wasn't like abnormal strings or anything that was supposed to be there. This is a negative colposcopy with a big Nabothian cyst, which is just a mucus cyst. That's just normal. This one had, it kind of is out of the picture here, but you can see it, there's a white lesion there. Uh, a little bit here, but I would have called that negative. But anyway, so we have a protocol at Duke, which we're then going to take overseas as we get approval to do these studies overseas. But this is our protocol here. We're comparing our very expensive colposcope to this pocket colposcope versus biopsy, which is not really available in most places in Africa because they're just not reliable pathology there. And then blinded interpretation by various OBGYNs looking at various aspects of grading these. These are the six physicians that have been reviewing these. These are some of the comparison pictures from our clinic. 
These are comparisons from our high-end Colposcope. Again, these, this is a Moraine IUD. The other one's a Paragard IUD. IUDs are becoming more and more common. Uh, great birth control. Um, anyway, this is normal, and this is a low-grade lesion. This is a high-grade lesion. This was the raw data from the pocket Colposcope compared to our expensive one. And this is color, computer color corrected uh, to try to enhance some of this. Now there are some issues with glare. These are the earlier ones, but we need to stop. I do. Yeah, look, students have class. Oh, okay. Yeah, okay. Well, then I'll just finish. But anyway, it's very concordant and works very, very well. We've already shown that. So it's very reliable in terms of testing with the the high end colposcope and those are, that's the data. So so much for all the science. But anyway, we plan to to take this. This was later, but anyway, I want to get to it. So one last thing, you get to dress like this if you do this. <laughs> so this was, this was the resident graduation party, uh, of which I'll credit our Global Health Fellow for taking this picture. But you get to actually, I, I've been to a lot of our resident graduations, never did I get to dress like this. <laughs>